This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Calendar. Do you wish your family life could be a little more organized and a lot less hectic? Now there's an easy way to make it happen. The Skylight Calendar. The Skylight Calendar is an innovative, smart, all-in-one touchscreen calendar that automatically syncs up existing calendars your family uses. Everyone's upcoming events are automatically organized and displayed for the family to see in big, easy-to-read color-coded time blocks. And with Skylight Calendar, you can assign household chores to your kids, keep grocery lists, plan dinners, and much more. And Skylight's mobile app keeps your family up to date on the go, anywhere, anytime. Managing a busy household just got a little bit easier with the Skylight Calendar. Now get $15 off your Skylight Calendar when you go to skylightcal.com family. Go to skylightcal.com family for $15 off. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-C-A-L dot com slash family. A choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a run. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expounding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very Expanding reality. Welcoming back with... All the gratitude. Mike Ricksecker, it's so good to see you, brother. You have a new book, Travels Through Time, which I cannot wait to get into and talk to you about. This is your 12th book. Am I uh, seeing this correctly laid out there? Uh, 13th, actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I've, I've got quite a few, but uh, well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, this was a passion project for sure, and uh, really happy with the recent release here. What's so cool? It's so time travel. I mean, uh, now what's great about this, uh, you returning uh, episode 136, guys, about a year since we're recording this now, uh, since he came on, that episode is going to be located down below as well as all the other ways to find Mike. So the good news about returning guests, man, we just get right to it. Like, let's talk yeah. about why time travel. What what was that all about? Yeah, time travel has actually been a uh, subject that has fascinated me throughout really most of my entire life. Um, you know, growing up as a kid, I love the movie Somewhere in Time starring Christopher Reeve and Jane Seymour, where he essentially wills his consciousness back to 1912 to meet this woman. And I found that absolutely fascinating. It was something I actually tried as a teenager, you know, 14 years old, had been a year removed from uh, moving from Massachusetts to Ohio. And so I tried to do that same thing where I tried to convince myself I was back a couple of years and could revisit and see my friends and all that sort of thing again. And I almost astro projected actually <laughs> um, yeah, kind of spooked yeah. myself at the time. I had no idea at 14 years old, what the world I was doing, what was going on. Uh, so that was, it was pretty crazy, but um, and all the other work and research that I've done, uh, it, it keeps coming up, uh, you know, different aspects of phenomena that people experience that there, you know, are relationships to time and possible time travel. So, this subject was going to be part of a bigger book that I was in the process of writing called Connecting the Universe. And when I was out in Egypt this past February, I did a large presentation concerning you know, Stargates, portals, Atlantis. We got in time a little bit. And on the bus headed out to one of the temples afterward, you know, it just hit me that, you know, Connecting the Universe is not one book. It is actually an entire series of books. And so I'm expanding this into, you know, multiple volumes. And I figured the best place to start would actually be the nature of time, time travel, how the universe works as a base to build everything off of. Oh, and now we're getting into time travel theories. And now we're getting into the structure of reality and how that, per, how that can be viewed in time travel scenarios. So Let's talk about a little of the things that you break down as far as just the structure of the way time works. So we're, we're told here that there's a past, there's a present, which you're experiencing now, and then there's a future that you don't know about. Now, you remember a little bit about the past, even though that we say 
very little about what actually happened and that eyewitness testimonies in traumatic events are actually the least reliable in court cases about calling on your memory from this thing you just experienced. So we have these, um, this construct, is that the way time really works? Well, time is, time doesn't really exist. <laughs> Time is a human construct to describe our reality. You know, we use it as a tool to plant the crops, you know, experience the seasons, you know, get to your job at the right moment so that your boss doesn't get upset with you, those sorts of things. But you know, time is really what we call time is really the, the fourth dimension. Uh, you know, you have first dimension, which is a line, second dimension is a plane, third dimension is a 3D object, fourth dimension is time or really where our consciousness resides and what's interesting about that is our consciousness resides in the fourth dimension inside the human body which is a third dimensional vessel so we are by nature multi-dimensional beings uh, but time is well, i have what i call stack time theory and i've had this idea for decades i've introduced it off and on throughout you know, all the work that I've done uh, here and there, and I'm formally introducing it now in this piece of work. Um, and in my research, I discovered well, Einstein had similar concepts in his space-time continuum with his block universe ideas, this sort of thing. And really what the idea is, is that every moment that, take like where you're sitting right now, every moment, moment that has happened, is happening, and will happen, are all happening concurrently. And each of those moments it's like a photograph. They're all stacked on top of each other. However, there are certain there are certain things that happen, certain incidents in which two of those moments resonate at the same frequency because everything is you know, resonance, frequency, vibration. Two of those moments will resonate at the same frequency and we'll get a glimpse of another moment in time. So uh, I, I delve a lot into time slips within the book, a lot of specific cases, uh, a lot of these, what some people might call a haunting or something like that. Not every case, but many of them are actually time slips when we see this actually occur. So cool. Okay, so now, I mean, we have to do it. Get, do you mind sharing some of your favorite time slips stories? Because I've got a couple too, like the Mary Antoinette one. Have you heard that mm -hmm. famous story? Do you mind? Yeah, the Versailles time slip. I, I start the, uh, uh, the time slip chapter with that story. Um, but one of that's really a favorite of mine because it involves a very, very close friend of mine, uh, Andrea Perrin, at uh, the house that's been called now the Conjuring House. It's old, you know, uh, 17th century farmhouse in uh, Rhode Island, Harrisville, Rhode Island, that the Conjuring movie movie is based off of. Now, the movie is far, far different than what actually happened at that house. The, the hauntings and things that they experienced there lasted for 10 years. But through all of that crazy stuff that happened, uh, even Andrea herself says you know, the most amazing, significant thing that happened there was actually one night uh, herself and her mother were up and awake and she was making her mother a pot of coffee and some food because her mom had been resting and asleep for uh, a large chunk of the day. And while Andrea was taking care of this, Carolyn sitting in the parlor looking out into the dining room area and there morphing in front of her was a family out of the 17th century. There was a woman cooking over a hearth over the fireplace, which at that time in the 1970s was boarded up. But there it is. There's a raging fire. Uh, she's cooking. There's a couple of kids running around. There's two gentlemen sitting at a table with pewter steins. And they turn and they look at, at Carolyn. And the one says to the other, well, would you look at that as if Carolyn was the ghost? So you know, absolutely fascinating. She's looking at a moment from the past and they're looking into a moment of the future. I'd lose it on these, dude. This is the coolest thing. There's a story of three dudes walking into a cabin uh, where their grandmother had just passed away. The grandmother, though, wrote down in her diary a time where she saw these three ghosts walk into the door and then freaked out. But they saw a ghost sitting in the grandma's chair. So it's like this crazy thing to where grandma wrote down something that she saw earlier on, but they walked in after she was dead. So what is up with this? And then you think about, well, if the earth is rotating and spinning like crazy, why, even if a house, like let's say is in the same location, do they, are they not like 10 feet higher? You know what I'm saying? Like if, if it's an yeah. electrostatic thing based on the actual geolocation of the event, magnetic north and stuff moves. So it's interesting that the same spaces, do you think that it could be confined within like the walls of a domicile, for instance? Well, there's are certain, uh, 
you know, effects that happen like when we uh, refer to stone tape theory, you know, that there's energy trapped within, you know, the walls of a building. And because uh, again, everything you were talking, you know, electromagnetic energy. And so you'll have uh, energy expelled from e an event and those memories will basically be trapped within the structure. And we don't really know what the catalyst is, but something will kick it off and it plays back. It seems like lightning has stuff, something to do with this. Have you heard about cases? I'm sure you heard in your book about lightning storms uh, having anything to do with this. Yeah, I've had uh, experiences where, uh, like, for instance, great example. I was doing a, uh, I was hosting a paranormal convention some years back, and we, we included part of uh, that event, a paranormal investigation afterward. And so it was, you know, bringing a few people around and it was getting late at night. There had been an electrical storm earlier that night. It was fantastic. This was at Mineral Springs Hotel, uh, Alton, Illinois. And, you know, there was uh, right over the Mississippi River, you know, we're watching out the ballroom windows, this lightning storm and the sky was purple. It was, it was really cool. Um, that kind of subsided a little bit, but you know how, you know, the lightning will ionize the air and kind of charge things up. And we're at the end of this investigation got a couple of the uh, people, a handful of us in uh, the upstairs corner suite of the old hotel. It's an abandoned part of the hotel. And it's a room called that's called Pearl's room because you know, uh, there's a woman that had died there. Her name was Pearl. It was a confirmed suicide and, and very tragic, but people have interacted with her there. So you know, we're up there. We're doing EVP sessions, things like that. So I hear some noises from down the one hall. So I go out to take a look and I'm peering down the hall. And I'm seeing what looks like black smoke billow forth from down the hall. And it's like, oh, is there a fire going on? You know, but you don't smell any smoke. You just see it billowing forth. And it started doing something strange. It was coming closer and closer. It was creeping up the wall on the right-hand side, creep back down, creep back up and creep back down. All the while, it's coming closer and closer. And then at one point, as it crept up that wall on the right-hand side, it morphed into the apparition of a little girl. And by then, the rest, the others had joined me. And you know, we're all trying to coax the little girl to come closer and come closer, come closer, that sort of thing. But she stopped right at this one particular doorway in the middle of the hallway. And this was a doorway to a room in which many people over the years had reported seeing the apparition of a little girl inside there. And they would, uh, you know, would interact with her. People had left things like teddy bears and stuff like that inside the room for her. And here it was, we were seeing her. And another fascinating aspect about this is we all saw her a little bit different. Five of us saw her. We all saw her a little bit differently. Like I saw her fully formed from her head down to about her knees, and then she dissipated away. Others saw her fully formed at the feet and on up where she started to dissipate away at the head. And that just really adheres to the to the fact that you know each person, you know, we have our own personal resonance. It's all a little bit different. Human body resonates between nine and 16 hertz, but everyone's a little different. So therefore, because of course the entity herself has her own you know, personal residence. We all saw her uh, a little different, really. So it was magnificent uh, event. And yeah, it, it was preceded by the lightning. Oh, my God. Now, the little girl, was that the woman, was Pearl the little girl who killed herself or was there just no. not the same thing? Okay. No, Pearl was a woman, uh, I recall correctly, she was in her late 40s. We're not really sure who the little girl is. Some people believe, like, we had psychic mediums and things like that in there. And um, a lot of times she's seen looking out the window on the general idea is that she's waiting for somebody uh somebody's supposed to come pick her up but never did oh tragic dude that is so yeah. tragic you know it's interesting too just sort of the energies in the area first of all you put on a hell of a uh retreat if you're getting smoke to come form an apparition and you've got yeah. everybody coming out in the halls they're getting the hell they're getting their money's worth i love that oh yeah uh and we need to talk off air uh, do you, are you familiar with the hill house in mineral wells texas i have heard of it i have not been though yeah, it's super famous. We know the people that run it. We can get a night there. So let's do a group and let's you and I go investigate this thing. It's well. okay. Yeah. On the road from us. It'd be cool. All right. So we're That'd doing be great. It. If anybody's interested in doing that, write out, uh, right into us and we'll start getting that set up. So, um, you know, it's fascinating too when we talk about the environmental conditions with this, because I'm thinking now about just the storms and the electromagnetic energy about this and how these apparitions look and it, it's, it sort of plays in the same realm. Also, the water component to this that storms themselves, like the water energy, 
you are the reason actually that I don't think about ghosts in deserts. When I had you on the first year, um, <laughs> think down below, guys, check out the first uh, conversation. You mentioned that humidity had a lot to do with the formation of these apparitions. Now, do you think that that has anything to do with the flexibility of time, or that that could, that water, lightning, or anything like that could be have something to do with these time slips or time travel? Yeah, I mean, water is a wonderful conductor of electricity. So, you know, when we look at some of the you know, more famous haunted locations, a lot of times you know, there's there's water nearby. You're talking about Mineral Springs. I'll tell you, you got the Mississippi River boom, right there. Uh, you got limestone bluffs right behind it. Uh, when I was talking about the, the conjuring house earlier. So one of the things that I believe is really charging that house is uh, there's a room in the basement that's called the well room because there is an open well with water right there, uh, still open to this day. The uh, walls of the room are made of limestone and they're capped with granite blocks. Now, this is a formation that I saw uh, in ancient Egypt all the time, the, the combination of the limestone and the granite. And then, uh, you know, back in ancient times, the Nile River was a little bit closer and they, they pump the, uh, the water in for different ceremonial baths and things like that. So uh, yeah, water being that conductor of electromagnetism, uh, you know, when we talk about time and time travel and the ability to be able to uh, to do that, you know, there is a uh, you know, there is a electrical component to it. Whether that is, of course, you know, people are going to go down the route of trying to, okay, can we build a time machine? Can we build you know something mechanical to do it? And our theoretical physics are saying, well, yeah, but we would have to use a lot of energy. But I think it has more to do with uh, the consciousness, it has more to do with the individual person rather than like a DeLorean and a flux capacitor. Uh, but, you know, think of the human body, you know, it's mostly made of water. So that is a, a component to help aid in that process for sure. I'm just thinking of also just time travel mechanisms and tech, and I had it on here to note to talk to you about, so we may as well do this now. Mm -hmm. Time travel tech, is it technically necessary? Yeah, I don't believe so. Um, I, you know, kind of just alluded there to the idea of, you know, theoretical physics and we need a lot of energy and we need something mechanical. Uh, they even go so far as to say, well, you know, a black hole will bend space and time. Okay, great. We're not getting near a, a black hole anytime soon. And if we did, you know, the moment you got close enough to it, it would just tear you apart, you know, spaghettification. Um, yeah, so, uh, so that's and not really feasible. But that said, um, you know, I, I again believe it has more to do with with the person, the the ability to tune your consciousness, to tune your frequency to specific moments in time. Right now, we're stuck in this one, uh, but you know the rules can be bent and broken. We see that happen when we see time slips and and other things happen. Uh, again, we're a multi dimensional being, so therefore, since you know we're fourth dimension consciousness inside a third dimensional body, that means we're already working within two dimensions here. Uh, and of course we can experience the second and the first. The trick is trying to get to the fifth. Mm. And so to be able to try to elevate the consciousness to the fifth so that you know, everything in the fourth, which is time, is accessible, that's where things start getting interesting. And I think it has more to do with figuring out that frequency of our consciousness more than something mechanical. What does the fifth dimension look like to you? Yeah, the fifth dimension, I think a, a great example, and it's science fiction, I think a great example was uh, the movie Interstellar. And they, uh, you know, there's the idea of the Tesseract. And a lot of times uh, this is done in a very clumsy fashion. Like the Marvel movies show the Tesseract as like a glowing cue that opens up portals and things like that. Well, no, <laughs> it's not that. And a lot of, um, you know, wireframe depictions of it that you can find online has basically it's a cube on top of a cube. And it's like, okay, you just to try to show the fourth dimension, you put something three-dimensional on top of something three-dimensional. Doing that does not make four dimensions. But the movie Interstellar, what they do is inside of their quote-unquote Tesseract is, um, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie, but the, the character Cooper falls into this thing near a black hole. They use that um, as kind of like the catalyst to access it. And he's taken to this structure in which he can see every single moment in time of his daughter's bedroom. And basically he has to pick out the right moment to be able to convey a message uh, over time. And the way that each of these moments are connected are through like these filaments, these strings, which I think is a great uh, call back to the, uh, the idea of string theory. Yeah. And as he's you know interacting with 
uh, these different moments, he's you know playing with the strings to try to send his messages. But uh, it just goes on infinitely, moments connected to moments connected to moments. He's able to see it all. And so I think that's, again, the science fiction, that's Hollywood trying to give us an idea. But I think it's a lot closer to an idea of what that would look like rather than a cube on top of a cube. It's super interesting. Did you see the new Flash movie yet? I have not, no. It came out really quick because... Um... Don't waste too much time on it. What I'll say is, is have fun, go into it, right? Enjoy it. But there's an interesting way that they portray time in there. Because you know Flash is always screwing with time and messing things right. up. Right. So th there's an interesting way in which they per perceive time that I think you would find interesting. It's sort of him in the middle of a circle with a, it's a, it's an entirely enclosed, but all around him, but like stacks of, um, like an uh, auditorium, like all these stacks of auditorium rows going back. And so that's how they perceive it with these lines of events going on all the way around him in linear fashion. Then you step up again, step up again. Hmm. It's an interesting way of depicting it. Interesting. Yeah. So with your idea with the stack time, because now I'm very interested in this and how it feels that Marie Antoinette can pop into a time where there's the same structure there, but there's different people there. I also think it's interesting mm -hmm. how we see old people like 1700 stuff like that we don't really see gal gork from the uh, lizard turds that take over this planet 100 <laughs> years from now right um it's just interesting also that none of our fashion took over until much later because if you've got people looking at us in warped tour t-shirts and you know jean jackets and stuff they're like ah we like our ruffles we're gonna keep that well you know i i wonder sometimes though that some of these beings or entities that people report seeing that they say is something demonic because it looks creepy or whatever you know what if it is some sort of time slip or time traveler from some other i mean now we're talking some other dimension for sure but from some other planet so one of the ideas um you know that I've postulated here something that's been thrown about a little bit here lately is you know, the uips ufo phenomenon that you know they're not actually extraterrestrials from another planet they're actually time travelers you know us from the future which is an interesting idea, but I say, let's not limit it to that, right? What if humanity, because, you know, kind of a path that we seem to find ourselves on, destroying ourselves half the time, um, you know, say, I don't know, 100,000 years from now, humanity has destroyed itself and we're gone from this planet, or maybe we destroyed this planet so much that we have to get off of it because we can't survive here, and we leave. And years after that, an extraterrestrial civilization comes to Earth, colonizes it, develops time travel technology in either, you know, wants to go back and find some resources or wants to just discover the history of this planet. And they're coming back so they can still be, yes, here living on this planet, but actually extraterrestrials from somewhere else. Or there are another possibility out there, another in, uh, indigenous intelligent life form that has evolved over time after humanity is gone. And as they build their civilization, again, develops time travel technology and is able to go back and experience you know, life on this planet during our time. Uh, and again, you know, what would they look like to us? Might look like aliens. They might look like, uh, you know, something demonic or whatever. Um, but still, it would be an indigenous life form to Earth, just not us. It's like blowing my mind right now, Mike, because now I'm sitting here thinking about these scout ships or something that that have so much more to do than go visit planet to planet to planet. They go to planets and then sit there and run the clock backwards or forwards to see what all happened in this one realm, right? Or this one area. But think of how much data and information and knowledge you could cover if you could just turn a dial and skip over a hundred years or so and be like, no, 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 go back, go back. What was that? They had parachute pants there for a minute. Okay, all right. <laughs> and then they skip forward. So it's interesting that these little blips in, blips out. It is more of an interdimensional or a time phenomena. So this is all so fascinating. You got me fired up, Mike, and I knew you would. Interdimensionals, how, do, how does dimensions and time travel play into all this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So in order to travel through time, you need to be able to traverse the dimensions. You know, I think when we're getting those slips or whatever, you know, we're seeing a glimpse of that, uh, you know, because we, we, again, we don't know what the catalyst is, but, you know, we're, we're seeing a little bit of that play out. But, you know, a time traveling race would be able to uh, move freely about and you know they have to do that and not necessarily the fifth dimension they could do that sixth seventh eighth uh you know we go up to there's 11 uh dimensions in our theoretical physics 
So they could be coming from any one of these other dimensions into ours, as long as they are above the fourth. So, you know, they, they could be, and I've, I've had interactions with some that uh, you know, were on basically a, we're on a research mission, you know, they're uh, exploring and trying to find out more about uh, humanity, but there could be also some resource that they need and they come and this is when it is, you know, it's on earth at this time. And, you know, they're getting that particular resource. Now you hear about, you know, various UFO uh, abductions and things like that. You know, when they, when they take those people, these people report you know, some sort of time loss. So there's a difference in time that has happened. And so, if you have this being that's moving interdimensionally, if they take them to wherever it is, this other dimension, they're going to experience time very differently. So they may think it was five minutes, but it was actually a couple hours, a couple of days. And it was fascinating is, okay, we have those type of stories here in our uh, UFO legends and lore and all that, but it was also legend and lore back in the 1800s, 1700s with like fairies and things like this. You know, the fairies would come and abduct somebody and time would work differently in quote unquote fairy realm. But we could really just be all talking about the same thing here. It's not, you know, fairies or ETs, but, you know, some sort of being that is working on just a completely different realm of time. It's just all bets are off, right? All bets are off. When you think about like the early uh, 1800s or something, when you've got these pictures of these dudes standing there with these pterodactyls that they just shot with muskets or, you know, these um, rifles, it's, it's interesting now to think that that pterodactyl was just flying along somewhere, minding its own damn business, hopped into a time slip, and now it's in the early 1800s with these dudes firing at it. Do you think that possibly this could be what like Bigfoot and everything is? It's just sort of inner time, and maybe there's that mm -hmm. this planet or this place is the only place to go, and really there's just a bunch of time that occurs here on a very stretched out, infinite direction, one way or another, stacked, if you will. And really that's what's being accessed here is just this realm through infinite densities of time in either direction. Do you think that's possible? Well, I mean, I, I believe, you know, there's life on other planets within the cosmos and the universe. And I won't always, I won't say exclusively, you know, it's always this or that. So when we're talking uh, the, the idea of some of these different entities being time travelers or some of these hauntings that we're experiencing being time slips, I'm not going to say it's all, you know, I'm going to say, you know, I think a lot of them are, but not every single one. Now, in the case of something like Bigfoot, uh, you know, you see uh, a lot of these reports of how someone's there and suddenly he's gone. So you know, is he some sort of time traveler? Does he have some sort of technology or is aware of things like portals? Uh, you know, it doesn't even have to be like, you know, uh, you know, technology like a cell phone or a device that he's carrying with him to be able to utilize that. Uh, from, you know, we're talking you know, some sort of, creature that is very aware of its surroundings, it may feel that type of energy of where different portals are at. And much like our other animals, basically kind of sniffs it out or senses it out and goes there. You know, if all of a sudden sensing, oh, humans are around, I need to get out of here. You know, where's the safest place to exit? Oh, I feel that it's over here. Boom, uh, go over there. And you, know, you have all of these reports of you know people going missing. Uh, you know, things like airplanes just disappearing out of thin air in like some of our different triangles, like Bermuda, Alaska, like 19 uh, places like that. On the first episode. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So is that what's happening here? You have these interdimensional portals that they're traversing through. Man. Uh, so do you think that just there are portals everywhere and that maybe people just walk in and out of these things just unbeknownst to them and maybe that they're concentrated more in sort of national parks and stuff and that's why they've bought those areas? Do you, do you think that there's like an awareness of these things in our greater government, let's say, air quotes or authoritarianism, whatever you want to call it, that the people telling us what's going on and then they just buy up all the national parks land or just keep it off to the side? Because have you overlaid like the missing persons reports over the national parks? And cave systems? Um, and David Paulides has done a lot of that type of work. Um, and, and I have followed some of his stuff for sure. Uh, you know, I think there are locations around the world that are certainly more prone to it. It's not always just a national park. You know, uh, we mentioned the Conjuring House earlier. And, um, you know, Andrea likes to call that as a portal cleverly disguised as a farmhouse. Um, <laughs> and, and because there is, you know, energy naturally occurring there. There's something going on with the well and all that sort of thing. Um, but you find like these very energetic areas of the world. Um, like we were talking about those triangle areas, but, you know, sure, some of these national parks have 
that type of energy too. Uh, the America Southwest, the Dona area, um, you know, you see that a lot there. And uh, yeah, I, I do believe people are just accidentally walking into portals. Now, what opens a portal? We're not really sure. Even NASA is trying to figure that out with the X points outside of uh, the planet. That's basically um, where the uh, Earth's magnetic protection you know, and the uh, solar winds from the sun, basically where they meet, they basically opening portals. And even NASA said, these are portals. Cool. They call them X points though. I guess to kind of you know give a different term than portal. It's a kind of keep away from the connotation, but they have admitted these are actual portals. Uh, they, how often they uh, open up are erratic. Uh, they open in different sizes. Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're big. And they have satellites out there monitoring this and they haven't been able to find any rhyme or reason or pattern to it, uh, but it happens. And basically those type of portals there are, are, are allowing uh, extra uh, solar wind to, to come through to the planet and you know, smacks off the ionosphere and then we have the auroras. Uh, that sort of thing. So same thing, I think, here on the planet. You have these portals that are opening and closing, and there are some areas of the planet that are more prone to this because of the electromagnetism. You, know, you have that uh, energy welling up from uh, the Earth's core, and as it passes through mantle and the crust and all that, it interacts with different metals and minerals, and depending on what is deposited there, it's going to create different electromagnetic fields. And so that's why you know, you have a lot Skinwalker Ranch and, you know, some of these other places that seem to be uh, high in electromagnetic activity with all kinds of strange phenomena happening. Uh, that's why. Wow. I'm just fascinated by this, dude. And to, th and to think that there are just portals like in between those two trees over there. And it's so interesting too. what you said, that Bigfoot can smell home, but it can also smell the other side of a portal. So it's almost like Earth is wafting through the portal and they can smell that. And so they come through this, these two particular trees and they don't know why maybe, but then they're now in a, in this part of our realm or something. And then they're wandering around and then they just smell to go home back through those two trees. Got it. It's such an interesting thing to think that you could just be wandering around here and all of a sudden be somewhere completely different. I'm, I'm sure. And I'm looking forward to getting your book, man. I just haven't yet. Uh, we're going to get one yeah. for you personally. Uh, yes. In there, do you have some of the stories where folks have said that they walked into a store, but it was 50 years ago, the same store? Do any of those type of things? Oh, I mean, you're talking again, uh, you know, about a, a type of time slip, really. Uh, but it, it's almost like it, it's a larger type of a slip where, you know, they've actually traveled. That's you know, so a little bit of a time travel incident, which is uh, you know, really fascinating. And, and that does happen. You hear you know, stories about those sorts of things. Yeah. And that's why I think the best tech, like you said, would be embeddable or you, the the thing. You know, maybe there's just a crystal that you wear around your neck and you can time travel anywhere if you meditate properly and you eat the right diet and you purge all the parasites or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you could just. Yeah. And I think it does have more to do with meditation. Absolutely. You know, and, and you know, you. Get yourself in tune to where you want to go. And that's why I always point, I, I point back a lot in the book to the movie Somewhere in Time. I think Richard Matheson, the writer, uh, was onto something there. You know, this, what he does with his character is, you know, he completely, he's at a hotel, a uh, grand hotel in on Mackinac Island. And, uh, you know, he discovers this you know, photograph of this woman and just immediately has this connection with her. And so he wants to know more about her and uh discovers she has a tragic tale but also when he goes to her house and visits with the uh, caretaker she has passed at this point uh the, the caretaker uh has in this one room that's dedicated to her a book on time travel and ironically enough it was written by his professor in college and so he kind of goes down this rabbit hole of might be actually able to travel in time to go visit her and he clears his hotel room out, because this is where she was at, was at this hotel in 1912, clears out everything from this room, sets it up like it's 1912. He buys the suit and everything from that era. Buys, uh, he gets money, like old coins and everything from that era, and basically convinces himself that he is there at the hotel in 1912. And does so, so convincingly that he actually does will his consciousness to that point in time. And I think that's the way it will, it will be. Get yourself into a meditative state, and tune yourself into that year. Yes, that's a manifestation um, technique anyway, right? Embody the yeah, whole Yeah, absolutely. Thing. That's so interesting. And But to apply to time travel, you're so, that's, 
It's honestly a manifestation thing at its core. A meditation, manifestation, you're sitting here aligning to the version of you that already has what you want or what you desire or is living the life that you desire. So in a way, you are time traveling. You're choosing it just in more of a, I feel snapshotty sort of a way to where if that's a reality over here, this is a multiverse reality over here, or dimensional, or whatever, then it's not a from here to there because that can be jarring for this experience perhaps until you mentally get ready for it. But this more stair step through the little snapshots and so you kind of veer rather than just appear there what about that though what about if we can do you find in our lifetimes perhaps that the idea that time travel doesn't exist or isn't available to us rather um, is a psyop at nature and maybe you will get to time travel and that that's something available to you in this life yeah i think it's entirely possible um i, I think we're learning more and more about consciousness uh, you know, the different meditation techniques that have been developed. I think we're becoming more in tune again uh, with with the planet and with the universe and how it all works. I have my, my thing called the connected universe. Um, yeah, and it's something that has been lost over time. You know, it's something that the ancients have, you know, the humans have kind of become desensitized, you know, over the millennia. And I think you know, there's a number of people, you know, kind of like ourselves uh, that are trying to come back to that. And I think as we become more in tune to the universe, that we will be able to do that more readily. Now, science, of course, is trying to do these things as well. And they have a whole different take on it where you find uh, you know, reports and uh, you know, published papers of where they're trying to develop wormholes in the lab. And they've uh, just last November, they published a paper that yeah, they have actually developed on the quantum level in the lab a, uh, a small wormhole. So uh, science is trying to get there a different route. Do you, do you, um, do you think time travel has already been achieved by humankind? I believe, yeah, I, I believe it's already happened, and you know, I, I think that there are time travelers on, amongst us, and I think that's why you know sometimes we'll we'll sense that something's been changed, something's a little bit different, and I can get into the Mandela effect, and I think a lot of uh, you know, if you go and you know, find a list of, you know, top 50 uh, effects of the Mandela effect, um, I think a lot of it is just, you know, fun type of stuff, like, you know, the way Fruit Loops was spelled or uh, the way Oscar Mayer was spelled, you know, like it's a lot of branding, right? Um, you know, I think a lot of that is probably just misremembering, but there are other things that are more obscure that, you know, a lot of people around the world, no connection to each other. Are, I remember this this way. Yeah, and it's like something within the timeline has been changed. Do you have any of those? Do you have any Mandela effects where you're like, no? Nah, uh. I, I do, and I detail that one in the book. It's it's a bit of a long story, but um, so I, that's one I'll, I'll say I encourage people to to read. And it's not one that you will find in any list out there of the Mandela effect. Okay, so it's one that we. But made. It was it was something experienced by myself, my mother, and then when I went hunting around for it. Other people around the world had experienced the same thing. Damn, I cannot wait to get this thing. All right, mine's in the <laughs> mail, guys. Located down in the show description. Check it out. Okay, so I want to know your favorite time travel movie besides Somewhere in Time. Do you have a second favorite like time travel movie that encapsulates a fun theory to where you're just like, dude, yes, that would be totally the way that this is working? Uh, uh. This holiday season, you might be looking for nutritious, convenient meals to keep you energized on jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, can help you fuel up for brekkie, lunch, or dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight <laughs> to your door. They just drop them at your door, people. You'll save time and eat well. You'll stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while taking all of your holiday to-dos in stride with good meals in the tum-tum. If you're too busy with all this stuff, these meals are easy. Easy to get done. They taste great. All you've got to do is head over to factormeals.com slash expanding reality 50 and use code expanding reality 50 to get 50% off. That's code expanding reality 50 at factormeals.com slash expanding reality 50 to get 50% off. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Somewhere in time is definitely my favorite. I mentioned Interstellar earlier. Um, I think the the concepts of you know being able to see every moment in time like that um is you know what we would experience from the fifth dimension uh, so i think that one is done really well 
Uh, I mean, I have other pop culture references throughout the book. Like I do talk about, you know, Back to the Future uh, because of the uh, the grandfather paradox that is involved with that. And so I you know, go down the route of, uh, of paradoxes. But um, and my favorite, uh, really my, not a movie, but a, a television show, my all-time favorite television show is Dark on Netflix. It's a German-produced television show. And absolutely fascinating uh, how much they delve into, I mean, straight up, you know, from uh, episode one, the very end of episode one, you're like, oh, this is a time travel show. Uh, but the way they connect everybody together and they talk about everything is connected, how they intricately connect all of these different people's lives throughout time. And there are bootstrap paradoxes all over the place uh, in this show. And they they keep track of everything really, really well. Uh, even the, the casting that's done for the show, like you will see the same character, you know, in three at three different ages. And they they did whatever they did with their casting. It's like, yeah, I could see that that's that person at 12 and that's that person in their 20s and that's that person, you know, in their 50s. Absolutely. It's phenomenal the way they do that. Yeah, if they hired a real person at all, it may be just an actor's likeness, and then they just age regress it with AI. Have you seen that they're doing this now with um, people's faces, like actors and stuff? Oh yeah, they've they've done some interesting things here. Uh, well, even like uh, the new Indiana Jones movie, it's like, oh, we got you know Harrison Ford back in his thirties, you know, hey, come they did a really good job of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the what is your thoughts on? time as you're perceiving it now it seems that some of us are experiencing something called the quickening and it feels like time is just hauling ass now I, it's not lost on me that time is relative based on how much you've lived it and also your experience and your disposition for example when you're a kid and you're six years old you've only had six what do your knowledge like five pretty much christmases yeah. so when your mom says christmas is two weeks away it feels like it takes forever because two weeks for you is a long ass time we've had a bunch of two weekses um but it feels like Time is speeding up, dude. The quickening thing. What do you yeah. think? Yeah, I, I get specifically into that, and it, it, I mean, a lot of that does have to do with math. I mean, yeah, when you're when you're ten years old, you know, one year of your life is ten percent of your life. When you're close to fifty, like I am, a year is only two percent. So, um, yeah, so there is that perception of time is speeding up, and that's because you have so much more behind you. Um, so I think it has it's more to do with perception on that level than actually time itself is is speeding up again time doesn't exist it's just our perception of this reality that we're within have you noticed your perception of time speeding up lately um yeah everything flies by i'm also extremely busy too so <laughs> yeah, yeah you are, you're always traveling you're in your adorable partner i, I see you guys yeah, everywhere you. so yeah Okay, so I want to know, you can, of course, time travel anywhere you'd like. And I'm not even going to give you the one or two. Where would you like to go in time? And feel free to list a few, man. If there's something that you've thought about that you just like, man, I'd really like to explore that, check that out, anything. Feel free to list a few here. What What are some places you go check out? Yeah, you know, I, I'd love to go back to to ancient Egypt or, you know, even prior to that. Because, um, you know, okay, who really built the pyramids? You know, was it the Atlantean civilization? You know, let's put to bed, you know, to, Put the rest of that uh, uh, that idea, and of course the Sphinx. You know, how old is the Sphinx? You know, those type of questions that uh, I've always really wanted to know about uh, that we we argue about these days. Um, yeah, in any of those large questions of civilization, um, you know, the the bigger mysteries. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back to uh, Jesus. Let's find out. You know, okay, what really happened here at that time and in the crucifixion and, and all of that. Um, let's check out the dinosaurs, you know, let's see what they really looked like. You know, where, where they really have scales. Some, some people are saying, well, they may have uh, actually had feathers and we just haven't found the feathers yet. Or, so, or some fossils actually do have feathers. So what did they actually look like? You know, so there's a lot of things I'd like to go check out. Yeah. Or if it's a bunch of dragons and there were no such thing as dinosaurs, right? Another psyop, man. <laughs> what do you think about that? Dinosaurs are a psyop and it was just dragons in a much cooler environment that they don't want you to think existed here for some <laughs> fun reason. That would be really cool. Cause yeah, some of these, uh, some of these dinosaurs that they come up with is like, we've got two bones, but we're going to, you know, make a drawing that looks like this. Right. 
<laughs> I love the um, paleontologist about 10 years ago, I believe. Um, I saw this TED talk with this guy who's dedicated his entire life to this study. And this old man stood there and he was like, yeah, so uh, we had to take all the dinosaur records and retract them by two thirds because it turns out that they were renaming the same dinosaur at different stages of time. Like you said, age regress. Mm -hmm. And so there were a bunch of like adolescent T-Rexes that they just called not a T-Rex, Aloquicosaurus, something like that. And so they redacted their story down to a, just a handful of what possibly are just simply dragons, dude, flying around here, making things really cool. Yeah, it's it's totally possible. And uh, yeah, so that's, yeah, definitely one of those mysteries I'd like to go back and see and have solved, you know, even, um, you know, how old is civilization? You know, we've, we've talked about, you know, pre-Diluvian civilization, how far does it go back? How many times has civilization, you know, risen, fallen? You know, th let's get those answers. See the cataclysms, all that kind of stuff. See what the resets are yeah. like. What if it's something to where like we just get to the end of time and then um, an asteroid impact comes in called the Younger Dryas and then it resets everything. And then we discover the pyramids here after some horrible cataclysm and they're in the same condition we found them in. And then humanity just sort of restarts in this way, rediscovering itself up to a point of a cataclysm, and then it starts over. Yeah, I mean, that certainly happened in our past. I, I definitely believe that, that the uh, the pyramids were discovered you know, by who we call the, the dynastic Egyptians. And you can find some scant remnants of that within their text that you know, they found the pyramids. And even to the point that um, you go to the Nubian Museum and there's this... Uh, you know, ancient ostrich egg that's like 8,000 years old. And you you see the depictions on there of three pyramids and there's the Nile River. And it's like, okay, we're looking <laughs> we're looking at a depiction of the pyramids, you know, far longer in the past than, you know, what our traditional archaeology is, is willing to admit. So, yeah, that is that has certainly uh, occurred. And we see uh, in ancient Egypt, the what we call the oldest alchemical symbol, which is the Ouroboros. And uh, we first find that on the burial shrine of King Tut. Now that doesn't mean that was the first representation of it. That's just the oldest we've been able to find so far. But it's uh, a symbol of constant recycle renewal of uh, not just you know, life, like human life or earthly life, but also of the entire universe. And so, uh, basically, it's symbolizing that you know when this universe ends, it's going to be reborn into another universe. So you know people want to know, okay, what was before the Big Bang? Well, the universe was not exactly formed as it is today, but there was a universe before it. And then following this universe, when it destroys itself, uh, there will be another universe following. And science is like starting to, to catch up to this a little bit. So. Uh, we've seen down in Antarctica, the reports coming out of there from the Anita Project, the Ice Cube Project, uh, of and this is based on um, research into the way neutrinos uh, act down there, which is very in a very bizarre fashion. In science, scientifically reviewed, peer-reviewed uh, journal, uh, Annals of uh, Physics, and they say, well, we have a parallel universe running in reverse time. Oh, wow, this is fascinating. You know, what does what does that look like? You know, what does reverse time look like? And I also also throw out, what if we're the universe that's running in reverse time, right? Yeah. Um, could be. So, um, but I've it, it just hit me when I was reading these articles on that, uh, relating it to the symbol of the Ouroboros. Because if you look at the uh, the illustration from the 1400s done by Theodorus Pelicanos, which is taken from an older alchemical tract from around 400 AD by uh, Synesius. You see a lot of alchemical symmetry between the number of feet, the fins, all that stuff. Um, of course, the Ouroboros is a snake in its own tail. But then you see two colors, the duality. And it just struck me, wait a minute. Constant recycle renewal. You have a universe running one direction and a universe running the other direction, right? So that's dualistic right there so you have one running in one direction other running the opposite direction you know the beginning of one is the end of the other at some point they're going to meet head on which i believe is that point where the snakehead is eating the tail and i believe that is symbolism ancient symbolism of the big bang and of course what's going to happen again new universe
That's so interesting. So do you think it's the same universe or do you think more of a toroidal field idea to where there's this idea that you create your life as you see it in a, tor in a toroid field. And so as you're experiencing life based on your paradigm beliefs and experiences, it spits back into you per se, is drawn back into your experience and then manifested back out as well. Do you think that it sort of works this way? Um, I, you know, I think to a degree, you know, I think the, you know, physically, the uh, you know the earth, the universe will reform the, the galaxies and solar systems will kind of spit out a, a in a different way. Uh, but that's physical three dimensional objects, right? The consciousness I think works a, a bit more like that, and so yeah, we'll we'll kind of be recycled back into the universe again. Uh, it's just if there's another Earth like planet that we're on, I don't think it's going to be you know, completely formed the way this earth is, uh, but there will be certain similar, I mean, it has to be an environment that we would be able to survive in. Um, so, you know, I think consciousness is going to, uh, you know, come back that way, but the physicality of the universe itself will be different. Yeah. God, what an interesting perspective, dude. Okay. Um, where do you stand on past lives that you have probably inhabited other vessels than the handsome devil we see before us? <laughs> or the handsome devil, uh, opposite me right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I absolutely believe in, in past lives. Um, you know, this is something, and I get into this a bit when I talk about the simulated universe, you know, that we come from, you know, some uh, other world beyond whether, uh, that's, I, I call it the home world for lack of a better term. You know, some people call it, you know, heaven, the ancient Egyptians called it the Duat, um, it has a lot of different names, uh, but you know, we come from this other world beyond come into this life. We live out our life here, learn some lessons. We go back up. This is constant recycling and renewal again, back to the Ouroboros. Um, now, the interesting twist on that, if you know, all time is concurrent, that means we have multiple lives going on here at the same time. So it really kind of makes you think about how uh, you know, consciousness really works. You know, are we, is our consciousness split into multiple parts and therefore we're able to experience multiple lives all at the same time. And our consciousness from wherever it's projected from is learning from all of these different lives at the same time. Have you done any past life regressions yourself on your side? I have, I have. Do you have any, um, any discoveries you'd like to share? Well, what was interesting about that? So this was during, um, it was like medieval times. And ironically enough, I was a scribe. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure that. Mike's a scribe when, you know, now I'm a writer. Uh, but I, I was a scribe for some, um, you know, archaic, you know, religious order. I couldn't really tell you which one. And, uh, but basically we were defying the church and we were, you know, we were found out. But uh, yeah, I got to see where, um, you know, we had the leaders of whatever this order was, you know, kind of talking to a small group of people. And I'm sitting at like a little desk, you know, writing out almost like a you know, meeting minutes or, or that sort of thing. Uh, so that was really interesting to see. Uh, but during that, that regression, that's also, um, I had a, uh, you know, experience that I wanted to dive deeper into. I think we may have talked about it last time. I'm not sure. Um, but it was a experience that I had with a shadow being when I was about eight years old. And, you know, basically it, it sounds like a typical shadow person type of story. I wake up in the middle of the night, a tall, dark figure standing in the corner of my room, scared me to death, got physical with me, you know, crossed my arms, crossed my body before it ran off down the hall. You know, it's something that terrified me as a kid. And even though I'd had uh, several other shadow experiences uh, elsewhere throughout my life and as an adult, you know, never anything really physically interactive like that. So I wanted some more information. We dove into that. And what was fascinating is during that session, uh, the hypnotherapist was able to actually reach out and contact this being in, in a way I was able to channel this being. And I got to see that entire incident unfold from the perspective of the being. And what I got from this, what it was telling us was that it wasn't there to try to scare me. And in fact, when it realized that I had woken up and it was fascinating to see, cause I'm like, you know, this taller being looking down onto my eight year old self, uh, it, it, it wasn't trying to scare me. It was there to do research. And when it realized it was scaring me, the whole thing across my arms was to try to put me in like a little self hug and actually got to see it pat my wrist. And then it ran off to get out of there and stop scaring me, but it was there to do 
research to study humanity and find out more about what type of beings we were. And that particular night, it was assigned to study a human child sleeping, and that was me. And so, of course, naturally, the questions that come up are, where are you from? And it answered with, I'm from another space. And so Ariana, the hypnotherapist, questioned back, well, when you say another space, do you mean another dimension? And I responded with, and this was interesting, uh, you may call it another dimension, but really it's another space. And so um, that really fascinated me coming out of that because it was you know, a realization that, you know, even though I'm writing it about dimensions in my book here, Travels Through Time, that our conceptualization of what dimensions really are is different than what they truly are. So what is this space? I'm not sure, but it's definitely somewhere else. And it was outside of our conventional concepts of time. Your wildest guess. What do you think? What do you interpret different space to mean? Because you channeled, you probably, you may have had a feeling of this as you were experiencing the words uh, coming out. So what did you feel when you said space? Was there anything you can grab? Yeah, something that is, you know, larger than what we perceive like the earth and the universe and something like that to be. So I use an analogy in, in the book. Um, it was actually, I pulled it from, and I give him credit, I pulled it from uh, a book called Man in Time by J.B. Priestley. This book was written in like the 1960s. Um, and he gives an example of, you know, let's say you're driving through a small town. And you know, as you're driving through the town, you pass by a couple of houses, a little general store, maybe a gas station, that sort of thing. And it takes you like five or 10 minutes to drive through this whole town. And so that is the town in time to you. But if you were to fly over that town in an airplane, you looked out the window, you could see the whole thing. And now what was in time is in space. So I think it's the idea of, you know, being able to see everything all at once. And I think when we, you know, elevate to the fifth dimension to see all of time, that's what's going to happen is we will be able to see everything all at once. And because there's so much, you know, I believe you know, these different beings are living in these other dimensions, so much available to them. And you think about like the history of our world, you know, how much, how much history of, of this planet can you stick in your head, right? It's, you know, you, you're, we just have fragments of what happened, you know, of what has happened here on the planet, different, uh, I don't know, science, pop culture, whatever. You know, we just have fragments of that. Now imagine that on a much, much bigger scale, being able to see everything of the universe for all time. And I believe that is the wide picture. That is the space. Yeah, that's the that's the big picture thing. And it feels like this is almost, Mike, what we're experiencing now with this age of Aquarius rollout that we're doing here with this idea that dichotomy is sort of the new way over duality. Have you noticed this with your existence that contradictory points exist in the same place at the same time? People two completely different points of view are absolutely correct and you can absolutely see that and this hard line in the sand of either or is what i feel like we're coming out of and it's it's a good shift to make it seems like the necessary next shift to where you can have some allotances and some allowances for people's perception not to be apprehended by your preconceived disposition about this place like your ideas and it, that is absolutely where you would be given that view from is from a larger perspective space and so, you know, when, you, when I asked what the fifth dimension looked like to you, you answered it perfectly. I'm going to ask, do you feel like you're in it now? Oh, that's a, oh, that's a tough question. So um, I would say right now as we're having this conversation, uh, no, <laughs> during this conversation here, uh, I'm, in, I'm in the, my consciousness in the fourth dimension. We're using three dimensional objects to have this conversation, but there are moments that I have in which, yes, I do feel that I'm on a, a different dimensional plane, you know, whether it's an experience that I'm having or, you know, some sort of like I've gone in a meditative state sometime that just, you know, defy all types of logic. Um, I mentioned, you know, as a 14 year old, almost astral projecting. And there was something I was tapped into and I didn't, wasn't sure what I was doing as a kid, but there was another time 
um, I was in this meditative state and I was, I grew up Catholic. So I'm going through, uh, Con- the confirmation process. One of the times uh, you know, we had to go to a mass with our sponsor and uh, the priest is you know, doing a homily and bored to tears because you know I'm a teenager and I want to go hang out with my buddies. Um, so I noticed this candle over by the baptistry and I'm just like staring at it and I start just zone out. I got into a real meditative state. For whatever reason, I'm in my head, I'm looking at the candle. I'm saying higher, higher. And sure enough, the candle's going higher and higher. It got to like a foot. Yeah, foot and a half off of you know the flame off of the candle, and I finally tr- realized what I was doing and snapped out of it. And so, yeah, I think there are are moments where I do kind of slip in and out of that. Um, problem is, I get so busy running around all the time with all the different things that I'm doing that um, I don't have enough time to quiet my mind and get to those moments as often as I would like. Man, I want to pencil this in for you I, because there's these dudes that are sitting here, these folks that are taking these domes, these glass domes over a, like a toothpick apparatus that they've stuck straight up and then a folded piece of paper over it to where it pivots, right? And it can spin and they'll put this dome piece over it to show they're not interacting with it at all and they'll move their hands a certain way and the thing will spin and then they stop nice. it and it spins the other way. And you're starting to see a lot of stuff like this, people doing things with water where they're pushing water back from the shore with their mind and with their intention. I feel like if we cultivated your skills here and just took like two less meetings and less podcast interviews a week, uh, then we could get these like <laughs> superpowers to come out in you, brother. I want to see this stuff. Oh, it would, yeah, I would, I would love it uh, for sure. And uh, but but I think you know really that's uh, I think humanity used to have these type of abilities and just we've like I mentioned earlier we've desensitized desensitized ourselves and you know now you know. You know, you have this uh, this perception that if you believe in these sorts of things and, you know, you're, you know, you're kind of cuckoo or whatever. But no, it, it's not the case. We used to do this in ancient times and those stories of, you know, the ancients being able to do some of these miraculous things. That was like every day to them, you know, and it's it's not just fanciful stories. This was reality to the ancients. Do you feel now that time is because we could all empathize and and we still get a little gut. <clears throat> check whenever your mom goes now what do you do again and you you, yeah. you feel that we're returning though to a time where it is more ubiquitously recognized and revered that these there is some something amazing that can be beneficial for everyone that some folks have around here and not to belittle it or gaslight it do you think that we're kind of coming back to something like that i think in a lot of ways we are you know it's uh i think society's become a lot more open to it these days which is a wonderful thing uh, you know there was a long period of time where um, if it wasn't frowned upon, you know, of course, hundreds of years ago, you're being burned at the stake for it. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that this is a time in which there's things are being so widely accepted now that it is opening those doors for us to return to that. Totally, dude. Okay, uh, did you get into the Philadelphia experiment and Albulic and time travel? Have you gotten into any of that or what are your thoughts on any of that? I mean, because it's been so widely covered, I didn't really address that uh, in this particular book. I kind of felt it was a little bit outside the scope. I might bring it up in some other works down the road, but for this particular one, I left that aside. Yeah, it's interesting. It's right up there with like the Project Pegasus and the uh, Andrew Basiago and all those uh, chronovisor mm-hmm. things like that. What are your thoughts on that? Like the chronovisor technology that the government allegedly has, where they did actually go and look at Jesus's crucifixion and the Gettysburg Address, and then to Andrew Basiago tied into that story as well. Allegedly, he hopped into a jump room in period clothes and went back to the Gettysburg Address, and allegedly there's a photo of him, and he's like, "Yeah, that kid right there." That's me, the CIA or whoever dressed me up like mm-hmm. this. I'm standing there. What are your thoughts on all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to prove, right? I mean, you're having you have an anecdotal story story from someone who's saying, "Well, this happened," and so it's it's hard to prove those sorts of things. Um, I, I think, <laughs> ironically, uh, time will tell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we've seen that, but we've seen that play out also here with, uh, you know, UFOs, UIPs here lately, you know, it's things that we've been talking about for decades are now starting to be accepted. And, you know, people are going before Congress and, you know, the, the government's actually listening to these. There's actually now a platform uh, that's, that's publicly there, you know, for these sorts of things. And so, uh, so I'll, I'll leave the door open for those sorts of things. I mean, I do, I do believe in, 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 in some ways, I am aware 
that the government uh, does have you know, really, really advanced technology to be able to do some absolutely fascinating things. Uh, I guess we'll see over, again over time uh, you know, what is actually true and what comes to fruition out of that. Man. Yeah, they're like, when do we, what do we want time travel? When do we want it? It's irrelevant. I love that movie, by the way. Terminator 2 or Terminator Salvation. Genesis, that's the one. Have you seen that? Genesis. Love that. I have not. No. Oh, you have not seen Terminator Genesis? I haven't seen Genesis yet. I, I think yet, you'd no. really, really enjoy it. Then I just ruined the best movie, yeah. uh, line in the movie for you. Okay, yeah. I, I would like to hear your, just a couple of um, stories of time travel, of time incidents that are just freaky woo-woo in your book that you just found fascinating while researching this bad boy. Um, interesting one for me is, uh, Emily Saget, who was a, uh, school teacher back in, well, she was a French school teacher, but taught in uh, what's now modern day Latvia. And with her story, um, it, I call what happens with her more of like, um, interdimensional phasing. What was going on with her was there'd be times that you know, people would see multiple instances of her and something was happening with her with her consciousness where she'd be up at the chalkboard and just getting very very passionate and would be writing something and then all of a sudden off to the side here appears another version of her and but also making the same you know motions as if she's this is like a carbon copy of her you know doing the whole thing except this carbon copy doesn't have uh, you know, the, the chalk in hand. And there are several instances of her doing this, like sitting down at the table for dinner. And all of a sudden there's another one of her there. Uh, you know, really, really fascinating stories like that. Um, you know, I have a, a chapter on kind of quote unquote doppelgangers that's, and that's part of it, but that something was going on with, with her that was causing her consciousness to shift. And you're almost seeing it. I mean, it was happening virtually simultaneously, but, um, yeah, there are times people would be walking down the hall or up the stairs. Well, you know, I, you, did you see, um, uh, you know, Miss Sage just, or Mademoiselle Sage just went up the stairs. I don't know. I just saw her over there. You know, kind of interesting stuff like that. Um, another interesting one would be, um, so there is this, and I was just talking about this uh, this earlier. I was on a uh, podcast with Jim Harold uh, a couple weeks or a couple years ago, and um, I was just talking with him about this earlier today that uh, there was this young man who, uh, when he was a child, walked into the kitchen and there standing by the kitchen table was this tall, dark hooded figure. Scared him to death, boom, he ran out of the room. As a young adult, he's at the kitchen table making a sandwich, wearing a hoodie. All of a sudden through the doorway, he sees this shorter, smaller, shadow person walk into the room and then boom take off and he realizes wait a minute that was me Damn. the whole time just at two different points in time so um so i, I related that story originally to my, my work on shadow people but it works here too uh, because i think that was really a type of a time slip and uh, again seeing himself at two different moments in time so it's also kind of a doppelganger sort of thing because there's two versions of him. But when we look at this case, it's like he saw himself only as a shadow, you know, not like a full apparition or fully formed or whatever. So was that a case in which we're talking about you know, frequency resonance vibration and two moments in time, you know, resonating at the same frequency to be able to see each other for a moment. It's just almost kind of like, you know, old school radio and you're turning the dial and you get a full you know picture when you turn it to the right exact frequency but if you're a little past that or a little before it, it comes in fuzzy and so is that what was happening here with this case it's really interesting Fascinating to look at yeah and then now i'm thinking with this case in particular that it had to do with believability because back to what you said frequency and vibration as a child you're pretty open to things like this you even mentioned mm -hmm. it yourself you were really open to things and so fully formed or you're able to see full manifestations as if they're real people to you the older version of himself wasn't able to see that because based on his time throughout the programming that's not in our reality. People say that that's not true. And guys like Mike Ricksecker write a walk in the shadows. And, and that's <laughs> awesome. So maybe this is sort of something to this as well as his believability about what, what he was seeing. Therefore, his psyche made it appear as a shadow because that's really all he could 
handle is something that glinted out, but it gave him enough to say, holy shit, when I was a kid, that was me that I saw, but it was a fully formed apparition as a child. Maybe that has something to do with it. Yeah, it, it's very possible. Uh, certainly. Uh, I mean, there, and there's a couple of different you know, aspects of, as a child. I mean, yeah, one, we are more open to these different things. And it's a lot of times, you know, our, our parents a lot of times are just trying to protect us and want us to be scared. So no, 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 it's just your imagination. It was, you know, just a bad dream, whatever, right? Uh, so there's there's part of that. Uh, but another reason why we are seeing a lot of these things when we're younger is you know, we were just recently returned from the world beyond to here. So, you know, our... Uh, our consciousness is still a bit more in tune to that world than, you know, when we get a little bit older and later in, in life. Um, and of course, you know, <laughs> the world kind of catches up to us. But uh, so, yeah, there's a couple different reasons why that happens. It's wild. And even if you do time travel, a shadow person suit would be a damn good way to do it. If you think about it, incognito style, you could still sort of and interact with the environment. But if you had one of those Manta black suits on are you familiar with that or manta black is that what it's called where it's yeah black. yeah see through it mm -hmm. that'd be an interesting thing to do right because then you'd be undetectable with sense but you could still manipulate objects do it at night yeah it's and i postulated that you know some of these shadow entities are you know some sort of technology that you know they think is going to be you know, it's, you know going to be a cloaking device so we won't be able to see it and even that uh you know entity that had that regression we went back and uh you know, couldn't had that conversation um, they didn't think that you know, I would be able to see it. You know, it didn't realize that until, you know, I had this interaction and, uh, me seeing it as a shadow, it, it wasn't by nature, a shadow. It was a totally different being, but, you know, it was trying to conceal itself, thought that it would not be able to be seen. And sure enough, I wake up and I see some form of it. So yeah, a, a lot of these shadows could be some sort of cloaking technology that just because whatever whoever the entity is doesn't fully understand the physiology of our eyes, it comes off very different. Yeah, like a man. That's interesting. Like a technology, yes, that apprehends the ability to be perceived as what you truly are, which mm -hmm. is even more interesting. Just sort of this masquerading, and you see this in nature a lot with the mimicry, right? With um, moths that have the wings on it that have owl eyes on it to make it look like it's a predator of the bird that would eat the moth. Right. And it's interesting whenever you look at this, then now I'm curious, whenever you did hop into the skin of that entity and you realized that it was you looking at you from another perspective, did you look at yourself? That's one of the thing in uh, past life. Yeah, I, I did. And that was, that was really bizarre. I'm looking down at my eight year old self and, you know, I saw my mouth open trying to scream and nothing came out because I was just too terrified. And so, um, I mean, it was one fascinating, but then also I am feeling terrible for myself too. So it's, um, yeah, it was, did you look really at your own body, like, and see that you weren't really a shadow person that you were maybe a lizard person or something like that, because you could see um, this was, yeah, this was like a, a tall, I wouldn't say lizard person. It was, it was more like a, some sort of light being. So, um, you know, very tall in nature, um, like a long neck. I can't remember too many details. Cause I was just kind of too. You know, really more to focus like I'm looking down at myself. <laughs> yeah, that's a trip. That is an absolute trip, dude. Well, and it is interesting, again, from these perspectives that ironically, the super bright light being that probably lit up the whole place um, masked itself as a shadow to blend into the shadowy environment where this young you was at. It's just absolutely fascinating, man. Okay, well, man, uh, we're, we're going to wrap it up here in just a little bit, but I wanted to know just one of your favorite things that you're looking forward to discovering with the time travel phenomena. Maybe some questions that you were left within Travels Through Time, which will be located, again, down below, guys, in the show notes. What's something that you're looking forward to be discovered and uh, unraveled in this mystery? Yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot more to, to work on here because, you know, right now we're postulating a lot with, with different theories, but um, I, I'll be interested to see what, science makes of, of their wormhole. I'm interested more on, uh, of course, the meditative side and being able to actually you know, will the consciousness uh, you know, back into time. But uh, the the research from here is going uh, to, because remember this is a series uh, connecting the universe, uh, is shifting a little bit into uh, Stargates of Ancient Egypt, which is the tour uh, that I run that's gonna be next April, by the way. And Brandon, I encourage you to come along. You love Very it there. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, but this is going to be, um, on calling it portal, uh, portal to the stars, 
inside I, the subtitle is going to be something like uh you know inside uh stargates of ancient egypt and atlantis something to that effect um so it's gonna uh you know, focus a little bit more on the ancient civilization side of this. I'm going to uh, delve more into how the ancients may have been using uh, time and time travel in conjunction with their Stargate technology. Yeah. And I, I, then we'll close on this. What do you think about uh, UFOs or UAPs being a portable portal device? Um, possible. I mean, not all. And I think that's kind of where, you know, people, you know, some people have postulated, well, you know, these UFOs, UAPs you know, are some sort of portal device, time travel device, this sort of thing. But then they make the mistake of saying that all of them are. And it's like, right, no, right. not all, not all. I, I believe there are physical craft coming here from uh, you know other planets. It might be probes. And we would do the same. Th- and we do do the same thing, you know, going off to you know, Mars and other planets throughout our solar system. But other uh, you know, other species in our universe, that they, they have a lot more time on us. You know, the, the universe is about 14 billion years old. We're only 4.5 billion years old. They've had a lot more time to be able to develop and travel. And so, you know, some of these are sure they're going to be probes from other planets, uh, but some are going to be interdimensional travelers. Some are going to be time travelers. So you have a a mix of different things that are going on here. So, um, yeah, some are definitely going to be portal devices, but some are going to be other things, too. It just really depends on, you know, the specific UFO or UAP that you're looking at. Yeah, you got your model. You know, what do you want to do? You're going off-roading, we got this vehicle for you. If you're going sports car, we got that vehicle for you. If you're going submarine. Yeah, there you go. It is fascinating, man. And thank you so much for taking us on this ride, dude. Um, all the ways to find you again. Travels through time, guys. Check it out down below. Mike Ricksegger, you're welcome back anytime, brother. Looking forward to coming and seeing you for the Haunted Hill House. Guys, seriously, write us in if you want to put that together. Uh, let's get something set up to be a blast. And then, of course, over there in Egypt, we've got a lot to look forward to, brother. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks, brother. I really appreciate it, Brandon.